So I want us to, uh, I want to remind ourselves of a sentence from Hannah Arendt's text uh, on revolution, on her book from 1963. Revolutions, uh, she says, are the only political events which confront us directly and inevitably with the problem of beginning. So it is only fitting that in a panel devoted to new beginnings in German modernism, a uh, paper should be devoted to revolution. And uh, I will proceed by comparing two, uh, uh, two texts, as I said, on revolution by Hannah Arendt of 1963, and what I consider a predecessor of uh, this very book, namely Gustav Landauer's 1907 essay, what he himself calls an essay, Die Revolution. But first, uh, let me take a brief detour that will try uh, and build a bridge between what I have to say and what Asiv said uh, about Ceylan and beginnings and what Arnon will discuss in relation to the hunchback of memory in Benjamin and Ceylan. So uh, let me bring you to May 4th, 1968. On this date, at the onset of the student protests that broke out in Paris, Paul Celan declared in a letter to the German student Gisela Dishna that he kept Gustav Landauer's 1907 volume, Die Revolution, within reach. I have, now, I have it now between two dictionaries, within reach. Indeed, Celan is known to have participated in the demonstrations, though he grew increasingly critical of the political jargon, uh, of its anti-Semitism and of the splitter party politics that they gradually dissolved into. During that momentous month, in the very midst of the revolts and clashes between protesters and police that surrounded him in the Parisian Quartier Latin, Ceylan, the poet, set out to reflect on the relation between writing and revolution, between participation in revolutionary political action and the testimony, testimony thereof. In short, on the weight of that volume by Landawa, the Revolution, that he kept within reach on his bookshelf. Ceylan's concern lay in the apparently unavoidable hiatus between action and testimony. Collective revolutionary action suspends individual isolated intellectual activity as much as writing suspends collective action. They are mutually exclusive. During a revolution, there can be no full concomitance of action and testimony, the latter always being delayed in respect to the former. With their immediate fleeting and fragile nature graffitis, Ceylan uses the word Mauerspruch as the title of one of his poems from this period, may indeed well be the most apt manifestation of the kind of writing that is possible in times of revolution. The evident contradiction consists in that testimony is necess necessary as a record of events unfolding and as a preparation of an archive for their future recollection. Yet by its nature, written testimony implies an at least temporary suspension, an interruption of the very action it aims to record. In this context, Ceylan writes down Kafka's famous 1922 diary entry about the, I quote, mysterious, maybe dangerous, maybe redeeming consolation of writing, namely the act of jumping out of the forceful alternation of action, tat, and observation, Beobachtung, towards a higher form of observation, eine höhere Art der Beobachtung, that is an action in its own right. If moreover, reconstruction in hindsight, i.e. historiography, tends to be biased by any revolution's outcome and thus to reduce the possibilities inherent in revolutionary action to its documented historical results, then the very essence of revolution, what has been called its spirit already by Karl Marx, the Geist der Revolution, its openness to a future of political freedom and justice is lost to writing. Consequently, it risks being lost to memory altogether. For this reason, and in order to quote, let the revolution speak for itself, as Landauer says, in 1918, he published a collection of letters in two volumes from the time of the French Revolution. Together, the letters, I quote, should have the effect of drama, sollen die Wirkung des Dramas tun, in a theatrical sense. In 1918, the, quote, intimate knowledge, unquote, that may be gained from such letters is not merely an end in itself, say, for the sake of Bildung. It should rather, quote, be of help to us in the grave times that stand in front of us, unquote. 
The testimonies from the midst of the French Revolution are, in Landauer's understanding, not a mere object of historical contemplation, but serve in a moment of political urgency as warning and guidance for an impending future of revolutionary action. The French Revolution should, Landauer writes in his short preface to the book, become our past. In a convoluted formulation, he adds that, quote, we have the obligation to gain the right to call ourselves heirs and overcomers of the French Revolution. The act of reading those letters becomes a crucial step toward attaining this right, aimed as it is at transforming the revolution from one among countless events in the past to a relatable event that belongs to our past and concerns us directly. The quote from René Charles Feuillet d'Hypno that Hannah Arendt discusses at the end, at the, in the last chapter of her 1963 book on revolution, Notre héritage ne précédé d'aucun testament, our inheritance isn't preceded by any will, expresses along similar lines the paradox of inheriting a tradition of which there is no written documentation that might bind the efforts of different generations together. Indeed, as the title of this last chapter announces, the importance of revolutionary tradition and the question of how to preserve the revolutionary spirit once the revolution has come to an end lie at its very heart. Arendt's formulation is of course paradoxical. In modern times, revolution and tradition are consider considered mutually exclusive opposites since revolution understood as the harbinger of what is radically new breaks with tradition in order to overcome it. And yet it is precisely towards this impossible junction towards conceiving and constituting a tradition of revolution that both Landauer's and Arendt's writings on revolution strive. Against this background, Landauer's statement that the collection of letters should have the effect of a dramatic theatrical piece that shows how everybody involved was just and unjust, right and wrong at the same time, die sollen das Recht aller und das Unrecht aller gewann, is of fundamental importance. In fact, by introducing this aesthetic and more specifically literary category to the discussion of revolutionary events, Landauer is saying several different things at once. First, he is hinting at the fictionality or fictionalization that accompanies such historical documents and in particular, their re recontextualization. Secondly, he is recognizing that the aesthetic and performative dimension of the documents actually enhances the perception of their complexity, attuning the readers to contradictions rather than leading them to easy judgments along pre-established partisan lines. Finally, he implies that it is by virtue of the document's literary transformation that we may perceive ourselves in an immediate relation to them. In short, the two volumes of letters from the French Revolution that Landauer edited in 1918 were supposed to bridge the gap between action and testimony, revolution and writing, offering an immediate recounting of the revolution, the aesthetic and rhetoric power of which would engender a revolution of understanding that should in turn enable the coming revolution to, mis to avoid the mistakes of previous ones. Both Landauer and Arendt pose revolution as a narrative and in the literal sense of the word, poetic or poetic problem as a phenomenon that defies narration and yet urgently requires it if it is to survive and exert a lasting substantial impact on human affairs. As such, Landauer had presented the matter already in his 1907 essay titled simply Die Revolution von Gustav Landauer. I think the pun was intentional. Um, and in a way, the letters published a decade later can be understood as implementing what Landauer had envisioned in, his, in this earlier text. Here, he had programmatically illustrated his understanding of the relation between past, present, and future as mediated through history and recounting by and recounting by pointing both to the German term Vergegenwärtigung and to the English term realization. While the former, Vergegenwärtigung, highlights the process through which the past is literally brought into the present, the latter combines contemplation, realized in, in the sense of betrachten, 
with action, verwirklichen. For as Landauer writes, every glance in the past or present of human groupings is action and building into the future. A few pages later, he explains himself further and even more explicitly. And I quote, of the past, we know only our own past. Of what has been, we understand solely what directly affects us today. We understand what has been only through what we are. We understand it as our way, as unseren Weg. Put differently, this means that the past is never something accomplished, finished, etwas fertiges, but something that is becoming. It was werden this. As was the case in the preface to the letters from the French Revolution, the weight of the passage falls entirely on the personal pronoun we and on the possessive adjective our. Thereby Landauer rhetorically and performatively achieves two different yet interrelated objectives at once. He establishes a community anchored in the present and affirms that this community becomes such through its shared orientation towards a past that needs to be constantly reappropriated and retold. Against any positivist and objectifying view of history as something distant and closed in itself, Landauer argues in favor of the relationality, porosity and inter interdependence between past, present and future. Revolution in this sense does not start on the streets but with a critical reading that questions established narratives and subverts, subverts static categories of thought, starting with the concept of revolution itself. Landauer states, indeed, that from time to time in a revolution of historical contemplation, the past must be revised, overthrown and rebuilt. Writing on revolution in the United States at the beginning of the 60s, Arendt's perspective cannot evidently but diverge significantly from Landauer's. Yet against the stark background of the many revolutionary events that separate the two books and that Arendt lists in the last chapter, including the short-lived Bavarian Räterepublik that Landauer gave his life to, the commonalities between them are all the more striking. Arendt's definition of revolution is more conventional than Landauer's as she refuses to apply the concept to pre-modern events and to Christianity in particular, as Landauer does in the Revolution. However, her stress on the danger of forgetting and on what she repeatedly calls the failure to remember is maybe exactly because of the now from which she writes much more insistent and emphatic. Indeed, her book may be read in its entirety as an attempt to carry out a revolution of historical contemplation in order to uh, recapture the lost, the lost spirit of revolution. Addressing an American audience, she thus exposes the American, what she calls the American failure to remember its revolutionary past. The only one, in fact, according to Arendt, to ever have been successful in founding new political institutions without degenerate, degenerating as all others did into bloodshed. The responsibility for this inability or refusal to remember to institutionally preserve the spirit of revolution is great and grave for, for it has determined a massive shift in the narration of revolution globally. Because of that, our understanding of revolution is based exclusively, Arendt argues, on the model of the French Revolution and thus on its negative, disastrous outcome. Therefore, all revolutions that have followed have abided by this pattern with the consequences we all know, and not least with the loss of faith in revolution altogether. According to Arendt, instead of seeing to it that the councils that guaranteed collective political participation would be institutionalized, the men of the American Revolution moved to taking care of private welfare rather than public freedom, opting for representative democracy as its most fitting political system and turning political action into administration. In part, Arendt forgives this epochal shortcoming on the grounds of the intrinsic structural dialectics of revolution according to which nothing threatens its achievements more dangerously and more acutely than the spirit which has brought them about. 
one may well understand the sense of bewilderment in front of this new spirit and the spirit of beginning something new, as she calls it, which is so hard to capture and maintain over time. However, Arendt does judge very severely the fact that the novelty of the new world's political development was nowhere matched by an adequate development of new thought. The situation is so dire, she observes at the end of the book, that there is nothing that could compensate for this failure or prevent it from becoming final, except memory and recollection. The storehouse of memory, she proceeds, is kept and watched over by the poets. Poets, Arendt writes in a footnote that is everything but marginal, provide, quote, guide posts for future reference and remembrance, not in the form of concepts, but as single brief sentences and condensed aphorisms. This specification on form is important. For one, the poetic word balances out or counterbalances the extensive, rich and plain argumentative flux of Arendt's own writing, what Tzela ben Habib has famously called her storytelling. The aphorism is crucial not, or not mainly because of what it says, but of how it says what it says, of its perlocutionary force. It should not explain or illustrate, but rather shake us into a revolution of contemplation as for example is the case with Lucille's Es Liebe der König in Ceylan's reading. In the footnote to the passage that I just quoted, Arendt refers to the novelist William Faulkner as exemplifying what she means, but she does not provide any quotation. After all, she had provided one already in the preface of Between Past and Future to the same effect, namely from, the, from Faulkner's novel Requiem for a Nun, published in 1951. And the quote is, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Barack Obama famously quoted it in, two, in a famous speech in 2008. The, poetically cunning of the, the poetical cunning of this sentence and thus its impact lies in its exploitation of syntactic ambiguity. Two possibilities are open. Either we read the second past of the sentence, it's not even past, as the first one, namely a substantive. In this case, we are confronted with a tautology, the past is not the past, that confirms the assertion of the first sentence with an argument ad absurdum. If the past is not the past, then it cannot perish since only the past is perishable. But perhaps in a manner that is much more straightforward, we can also read the second past as an adjective fulfilling a predicative function. Then the past will never be dead because it would never definitively have gone by or elapsed. It would never be limited to the present, but would rather incessantly penetrate it. Or as Landauer would have it in the Revolution, every instant the past that is alive within us rushes into the future. This year, to mark the 60th anniversary of its publication, the London-based gallery of Richard Saltoun is devoting an exhibition to artworks that may be understood to engage with Arendt's essay collection in between, essay, essays collected in between past and future. Among them are small scale sculptures of impossible, often inaccessible private and public spaces by the late Iranian American artist Siar Majani. The house above the bridge from 1974-75, which is not on display in the gallery, shows a small house with just a door and no windows sitting on the upper part of a light structure that constitutes a bridge between two edges. In its bare simplicity, it lends itself, as many of Armajani's sculptures do, to multiple readings. Against the background of what I have tried to recall today, of the effort to bridge past and future in the name and through revolution, I would like to highlight its eerie paradoxicality. Needless to say, this is no place for a house. How does its inhabitant even get there? And will the structure be able to hold its weight? Is a bridge still a bridge? If rather than connecting two points in space, it supports a third in guise of a pedestal. I would like to imagine that the memory of revolution resides in that house, that storehouse, to use Arendt's word, suspended in an impossible balance between remembrance and forgetting, between past and future, and between action and contemplation. Moreover, I'd like to imagine that the blocks on which the two ends of the, bridge, of the bridge rest, displaying an alternation of lighter and darker wood, are, in fact, the books that rest 
on our shelves within reach and on which the whole fragile construction of our memory and of our future rests. Thank you very much. <laughs>